called Ecuador, how an authoritarian government is fooling the entire world. We have two speakers, Pedro Noel, who is a co-editor co at the Associated Whistleblowing Press, and Bethany Horn, who is an activist and a writer. So their question is, is Ecuador really interested in free speech? They don't think so, and they will let you know why. So please welcome with me on stage, Bethany Horn and Pedro Noel. So hi all, good night. Thanks first uh, for the CCC for bringing us here, accepting our talk and supporting us being here. I'm Pedro Noel, I'm a Brazilian journalist. I've been since 2010 working with leaks, it means uh, restricted materials of public relevance, uh, both publishing leaks and uh, analyzing. Currently I work as a co-editor in the Associated Whistleblowing Press, which is an NGO uh, working in implementing, running, and operating whistleblowing platforms, always in a local way. Among other platforms, we run in Iceland, in Spain, in soon in, in Peru, I hope. <laughs> uh, we also have a platform in Ecuador, which is called Ecuador Transparente. I'll talk more about this platform later on, so now let Bethany introduce herself. Um, so I'm Bethany Horn. I Grew up in Ecuador, um, but I started working as a journalist in Canada. I then moved back to Ecuador and worked at the state newspaper there, El Telegrafo, um, for a little bit, very short little bit. And then I went to work for a academic research group at a university. The academic research group was run by hackers and we were researching um, copyright and other policy issues to advise the Ecuadorian government. Um, the first thing that I want to say and that I need to say is that I recognize that Ecuador has to, has to be praised and thanked for the very brave act um, of giving asylum to Julian Assange. I'm glad that my adopted country has taken on this role in the world and stands up to the United States on this one issue. Defending WikiLeaks's right to publish and exist is a human rights issue. Um, I think that Julian Assange is in danger of extradition and the Ecuadorian embassy in London is the only thing keeping him safe. But it would be a mistake to assume that this portion of Ecuador's foreign policy has any effect on their domestic policy. It doesn't. Governments are made up of people. Um, and inside the Ecuadorian government, like inside many governments, there is a war between factions. Um, some good, some bad. This is a government that has been in power for eight years now, and they intend to stay in power for many more. President Rafael Correa and the political party that he started are concerned with power. Uh, they'll change the rules that they themselves created in order to keep power. An example of this uh, is a recent, well, this has been going on for a while, but in 2008, they wrote a new constitution that set limits, term limits. Um, recently, they've grown so worried about whether they can win another election without Rafael Correa that there was two years of discussion about changing the constitution so that they could re-elect Rafael Correa for a third or maybe fourth term indefinitely. Uh, they didn't end up doing that. They did change the constitution, but Rafael Correa decided he didn't want to run anyway, so they didn't change it to make it friendly to him. Uh, but this is just an example that I wanted to give of uh, of one of the tactics that the Ecuadorian government has for maintaining control, and that is the laws. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the laws that they've brought in that deal with communications especially and how it, this affects democratic freedoms, journalism, and free speech. But there's a second, more worrying way that the current government in Ecuador is exercising control, and that's through illegal means. 
Um, Pedro has published documents via his whistleblowing platform that illustrate this, and he'll talk about them. Um, Ecuador's constitution protects citizens' right to intimacy, so we consider certain kind, like the spying that is revealed in the documents to be illegal. There are other illegal tactics popping up in Ecuador, stuff like threats of violence, censorship. Um, not all of it can be linked directly to the government, but we'll talk about it too. Ecuador's intelligence services are heavily implicated, especially in the illegal stuff that we see going on. Uh, the intelligence agency in Ecuador is called the SENAIN, the Secretaría Nacional de Inteligencia. It also has another uh, short form SIN. And it's, it's Ecuador's biggest problem. Uh, but the government's other institutions, the presidency, the National Assembly, and the super powerful communications uh, secretariat, they all benefit from the intelligence that's gathered by, by the Sinaín. They're benefiting, benefiting from it, and they're not challenging it. Um, so laws need to change in Ecuador but also its institutions need to be made to follow the law. International pressure helps, which is why we are here. Um, so after, at the end of our talk, we'll deliver a message to Correa because we know that he listens, and we know that he listens because, well, I found my picture in the Sinaín leaks. So I know I have a certain amount of Caché. Uh, we know he listens because he responds. Uh, he, uh, he's very vocal. <laughs> he does his own Twitter feed. Last time I wrote about Ecuador, he responded to me on national television for 14 minutes, which was fun. His, his account, we'll get there. <laughs> I want to I, I want to first give like a picture. <laughs> the key to understanding him is is understanding that he craves control. We had a video that we were going to play now, but it didn't work. I believe that I linked to it on my blog bbhorn.com. If you want to see the video later, I will I will put it up there. Um, he craves control. He had such high approval ratings for a really long time because to a certain degree, Ecuadorians agreed that keeping stuff under control was important. To understand why control is the key word, I want to give a brief outline of the 10 years in Ecuador before Correa came to power. So, um, the first character in this story, oops, is this guy. He was uh, elected in 1996. His name is Abdallah Bukaram. He was elected despite the Hitler mustache. Uh, he was a populist, kind of unpredictable. His nickname was El Loco, the crazy guy, and he really was insane. He would go on TV and sing songs. Um, and he embezzled a whole lot of money. Congress declared him mentally unfit to serve as president. It was a Congress made up of his political enemies. They had to go against the Constitution in order to do this, in order to name his replacement. Um, but he was, he was kicked out of office after two million Ecuadorians took to the streets for weeks and shut down the country, basically. Um, so this is the first of three soft coups in the 10 years that came before Correa. His presidency was very short. It ended in 1997. Congress appointed an interim leader. Uh, and then the next guy that's elected is Jamil Mawad. He's sort of the opposite of Abdullah. He was very smart and he was a known political actor. He'd been the mayor of the capital city. He was right wing. Um, and governed pretty predictably. He, during his presidency, Ecuador was hit with the worst financial crisis in generations. 70% of the banks in the country closed. Um, thousands of families lost their savings. P 
families were split up because people had to migrate to Italy and Spain and the US in order to find work. Um, he dollarized the economy because inflation got so bad that Ecuador lost its currency during his presidency. And again, people took to the streets, shut down Quito, shut down the highways, protested. Um, and an army general refused to stop the protesters from taking over the presidential palace. And again, he had to leave. His vice president took over, finished, oh, finished up his presidency. This is the second soft coup. Um, and this was in, when was it? Um, 2000. One? Yeah. Uh, anyway. So next is this guy. He was actually the army general who didn't stop the uh, protests from taking over the presidential palace. This is Lucio Gutierrez. He's another populist who was close to left and indigenous movements at the beginning when he ran, similar to Abdullah. But he quickly lost that support because he governed like a neoliberal. Um, and by this point, people just knew like, okay, we can get rid of him. So they took to the streets, protested, and uh, he was gone. <laughs> uh, so by the end of this, I mean, Ecuador has a young democracy. They had a military di dictatorship for a while. By the end of this, uh, People were pretty demoralized about, de it was bad for business, all the coups were bad for business. Oops, I skipped a slide. And, and people were ready for something else. So 2006, Rafael Correa runs a campaign with a totally new party. Um, he promises that he's gonna disband Congress and call new elections to rewrite the constitution after he wins, and he wins. Uh, he got a lot of support by promising to be different. And he started out really well, and a lot of us, myself included, were excited by his first years in office, and we liked his, we liked his constitution. But in 2010, he lost control, and as you remember, control is very important to him. There was a protest by the police union that shut down streets, and people were getting flashbacks to, uh, to 1997, 2001, and, and 2003. The police cornered him. He needed the military to rescue him from a hospital. There was a shootout. People died. He calls it a coup attempt. And I don't call it a coup attempt. I think it's debatable. And that's a debate we can talk about another time. But what was true is that it really scared him. And after 2010, um, the need for control started to clash with his original promise of democracy. And it's this clash with democracy that is my problem and our problem as people interested in universal human rights. So I want to talk about the laws, the legal stuff that's been going on in Ecuador that's threatening speech and publishing and uh, dissent. So the first one was the Constitution of 2008, which, as I said, had a lot of progressive and good innovations in it. Um, it affected the media because it, it legislated the separation between um, people owning media and other businesses. So a lot of bankers got their newspapers and TV stations expropriated by the government, uh, which people supported. They didn't want bankers having that much power over the media, but it led to concentration of a different sort. The state uh, never sold those media outlets, and the state went from owning nine public media outlets to owning 42. And this concentration trend is continuing um, as papers uh, fold and get, one just recently got bought by the state newspaper and another one closed last year. The second law is the communications law in 2013, uh, which was really, which was sort of a 
wish of Correa to bring in earlier, but he didn't have support in the assembly. And in it, there, it creates the crime of media lynching, which it describes as a co coordinated dissemination of information, which sounds a lot like journalism, uh, with the purpose of discrediting or harming the reputation of a natural or legal person. It doesn't say if that information is false, as if it harms the reputation of a natural or legal person and it's a coordinated publication, then uh, you could be in trouble. This law also makes media outlets responsible for online comments. A lot of newspapers shut down their comment sections after it. And it creates regulatory agencies to enforce the murky law. The biggest one is the Supercom, which um, forces corrections. And I want to show... So this is a cartoon of a police raid on a journalist's house two years ago. It was done by Javier Bonilla, who is one of the country's biggest cartoonists. The government didn't like it. They said that he had to issue a correction on his cartoon because it showed the police being too violent, I guess. So he drew a correction which shows the police knocking very politely and uh, <laughs> asking kindly to take the journalist's computer with them. And uh, we'll keep it in a closed envelope to preserve chain of custody and uh, have a happy Christmas. So. Uh, Cartoonists have a little bit of fun with it. This is another one that I like. Um, they asked this magazine to issue a correction of its front page image because they thought that the wrecking ball destroying the logo of the social service agency was not accurate. And they just, that was their correction. So it's a little, it's a little boring. Um, there's a lot of fines that come along with this communication law. They've now issued uh, $200,000 in fines, at least in the past two years, to journalists. And self-censorship, because journalists don't want to get fines. So there's the kind of way how much they can say and not go against the communications law. Um, And the third law is just within the past month, they changed the constitution, as I said, and they made communication a public service. And nobody really knows what they mean by this, um, whether it means that communication passes to be a responsibility of the state, like water and electricity. But this is what journalists are afraid of, and they don't really see the trend going in a good way. So they were opposed to this to this. There are other difficulties doing journalism in Ecuador. I experienced some, um, and others have experienced others. You can ask me about it later. And then, so, the illegal framework for control that, that, uh, that goes hand in hand with this legal one. Ecuador sort of was a star of the hacking team info dump. There was a lot of evidence in the documents released by WikiLeaks, uh, published by WikiLeaks, released by some friendly hacker, uh, that Ecuador is a client of hacking team. This was the receipt, I believe, with, a, with the contractor Theola in Belize. Based in Belize, yeah. Um, so the government denied, after this information came out, they denied that they had any relationship with Hacking Team. Of course, they don't have a contractual relationship with Hacking Team. They have a contractual relationship with the intermediaries. And I'm going to let Pedro talk about what his documents show about, the, about Senain. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'll just make a very practical example uh, regarding two, two publications my organization did. 
related to illegal surveillance in Ecuador. And the platform who did that was Ecuador Transparente, which is a, a local platform uh, for whistleblowing. They use uh, free software, uh, Globalix. And uh, yeah, first publication is from August. Uh, it's, we published 31 pieces of the Ecuadorian intelligence, which were stating that they constantly uh, surveyed journalists, um, human rights actors, uh, ecology, eco eco ecologic uh, groups, and politicians, right? They did it in two ways. First, uh, they did it in a physical way, in a digital way. This, for example, is uh, as a collection of, uh, of records, like inner records of the government. It's not in public information, but it's information that the government can gather. So they, they were building profiles over people. So this profile, for example, is a profile of the cartoonist that uh, Bethany just mentioned it. That oh, were the journalist in the cartoon. Sorry? The journalist in the cartoon. Exactly. The journalist in the cartoon. Or no, it is the cartoonist. Yeah, it's the cartoonist. Yeah, yeah. No? So uh, it's a profile made of, of him based on like uh, all his travels, like which countries the, for which countries he was going, and which date and time, how much money he has on his accounts, how many cars he have, how many houses he have, all this. This is you could, you could say that it's legal because they are using uh, public re like inner records of the government. Then you have also digital surveillance based on active surveillance, which is uh, surveillance based on metadata collection. We don't know how yet they got this, these things. We suspect that it was in compliance with uh, internet, internet service providers and communication service providers. So they were building these graphs based on for whom people were calling, for whom people were sending mails, from whom they were receiving calls, from whom they were receiving mails and then building these like, detailed reports. Like this woman, for example, is a journalist for the, one of the biggest television channels in Ecuador. Physical surveillance. This is even more, <laughs> like this is a, <laughs> a proof that they were really following and infiltrating in events and life events of the major of the capital city, Quito. So after publishing it, we were really asking a an answer from the government. But the answer they did actually was they s the embassy sent a letter to our media partner for this publication in Germany, Netspolitik, for example, saying that the, the documents should be taken out, this, the website, and that they, they, they would, the journalist that Netspolitik was, was performing was not good quality journalism. Then they sent a letter to our ISP saying that, uh, the, <laughs> accusing us of four things. First of, it, first of them, copyright infringement, because actually in the documents we published it, there were logos from the government. <laughs> 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 then they also accused, which is more serious, uh, that we were infringing uh, five articles from the penal code, one of them passive of indefinite detention. So thanks for both Greenhost and Netspolitik for sticking with the materials online and telling us that they received this, this material and for publishing this material. I think actually Netspolitik published the letter they received. Uh, so now I'll make a very, I don't, I don't think we have too much time, so I'll make a very fast publication. Uh, you are the first ones to see these files, actually. I'm just, we just uploaded um, 15 minutes ago. It's an analysis of the risk factors for Ecuadorian democracy made up by the intelligence service, okay? So you can see what, what they consider risk factors for democratic stability and what they consider to be uh, uh, events of risk for democratic stability. So you can see in the middle of everything, is, it's media, mediatization of factors, of critical factors. So for them, what is most important and one of the most dangerous things is that they have media covering critical points in their society. Then, for example, they have graphics like relating events with media coverage. Then here they have uh, an analysis of an event of risk. So they were, this event of risk is concerned to the change of laws that Bethany said, 
So they were preventing that changing the laws would make that civil society and citizens would be <laughs> enraged and feel that their basic rights were harmed. And if media would cover this, like big protests could outcome. Uh, so I don't have too much time, so you can search this in data that's awp.is. She put es, but it's is. Uh, so you can just check it. I don't have too much time to develop on this now. So we have some conclusions, which is uh, like complex problems demand complex solutions. So for example, is Ecuador helping the cause of free speech by providing asylum to Julian Assange? Of course it is, of course. But is Ecuador really interested on providing freedom of speech inside the country? No. So you can perfectly criticize Ecuadorian policies regarding surveillance, but, and also support WikiLeaks. Actually, if you fall in this argument that you can't criticize Ecuador because they are providing asylum to WikiLeaks, you are exactly following the argument that the Ecuadorian government wants, you will be able to, which is to avoid external criticism. Then, uh, I want to address actually two messages. First of all, this one is, is for you, like international community, which is please help support and spread all this information because we don't have enough coverage about it. Like uh, most of the coverage which criticizes Ecuador, unfortunately, is biased by an anti, anti WikiLeaks feeling. But actually, this is like truly, truly something that both me and Metony we saw and experimented as journalists in Ecuador. So if you can spread this message, share this information in your channels, or being in, in person or in an institutional way, we are very welcome. You can also keep sending us leaks. We, are, we, we promise we're going to we'll keep publishing it. Then to finish, we I have just, um, well, actually this is, we can't tweet uh, <laughs> the present because Bethany uh, is blocked because yeah. they were after a, a, a pretty harsh conversation on Twitter, so she can't uh, access the, the president's profile, but you can tweet it, him. It's Mashi Rafael. <laughs> so so the, the second message is exactly to him, which is this, addressed to the Mr. Rafael Correa, the president of the Republic of Ecuador. So we are kindly asking him to implement oversight mechanisms in his intelligence service which could allow Senaim to be accountable for what they do, because so far they've been acting with total impunity. They are not even obligated to go to the National Assembly to ask questions from the assemblies. They can just deny or miss the appointment as they did the last time. They said that they were going, then they said, ah, no, we could not go, and nothing happened. So, so far, Senaim is working in total impunity. Second thing we are going to ask to Mr. Rafael Correa, President of the Republic of Ecuador, is to refactor the inner mechanisms of Senaim in order to establish really basic standards of transparency and accountability inside Senaim. Until he, does, he doesn't do it, we will continue leaking and we will continue exposing and we will not be afraid of harassment, we will not be afraid of legal, paralegal, or illegal surveillance or pressure. He must know that. <laughs> then, <laughs> then this, like the last thing we ask to Mr. Rafael Correa, President of the Republic of Ecuador, is to grant its citizens and all the foreigners which are working or living in Ecuador with one of the most basic rights of the people, which is the right to communicate freely without any interference by any means. Thank you. What do you think? Do we have time for questions? Okay, so thanks very much for the talk. As you can <coughs> see, we have a little over time, so if you want to leave the room, please do so, but quietly. So, if you have any questions, please line up at the microphones so that Pedro and um, can answer them. Yeah. So, we've got the first question at mic number two. Hi. 
Um, so oh, I actually great. work for Greenhouse, which is, so we host Pedro's website. And we wanted to say that we didn't get a warrant, so we didn't actually remove any data. We actually forwarded the request because it wasn't legal. So um, Thank you. I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sticking. <laughs> Okay, another question Hello. from Mike number two. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, um, if uh, there has been a uh, uh, reaction uh, by the government uh, in a legal means or, uh, I don't know, with uh, uh, blackmailing or something similar. I mean, us, like, it's nothing that we can prove. Like, with Bethany just told about legal things they did with other people. With us, we just not said that they were really pressuring our potential sources. And yes, in the airports, it's always, it's always shit to leave Ecuador or enter Ecuador. Yeah, but f more, than, more than that, like uh, nothing. And then th these letters of pressure and, uh, and stuff. But so far, we think that maybe there is some investigations going on, but so far, it's just pure fear and pressure. Okay, next question, Mike number six, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I just wanted to know, um, I think on the president's uh, thing here, it said, mi poder, my power. What, what, what is that about? Mi poder en la constitución. Oh, okay. Uh, so my power through the constitution, <laughs> which... Which he changed it. <laughs> okay. The next question will be Mike number three. Hi, I was just wondering what other types of digital tools or technologies besides Global Leaks or Greenhost services might be helpful to um, journalists in Ecuador? Well, all the ones that you would recommend to journalists in general. You have more experience than I do trying to train journalists in Ecuador how to use secure technologies. It's an uphill battle. Um, what do you think? Well, I mean, there are a lot of tools that's not only in Ecuador, but in all over the globe journalists can use. But I think I'm not the, the best person to talk about it, but you can search for example, like, any, like Tor or Tales. I wish, or I wish that journalists in Ecuador used Tor. I wish that journalists in Ecuador used OTR. Um, I wish that journalists in Ecuador used Signal. And I wish that they encrypted their hard drives because as we see, there are raids, uh, there's danger. It's not just journalists. A tweeter who tweeted, um, what was he tweeting? She or he was tweeting about nepotism in the ministry, in one of the ministries, and he got sent to jail for two weeks, not for publishing any incorrect information, just because uh, it was considered libelous that he accused the minister of, of nepotism. So regular people are vulnerable too, um, and people should be protecting their, their home drives and their, their communications because there's a lot that's going on and it's only getting worse. Okay, next question from mic number one, please. Uh, so I have actually two questions. The first is, how has uh, the judicial system responded to these uh, new uh, laws that regard the freedom of expression, as you put it. And the second question is, according to your point of view, what is the state of internet freedom, uh, especially of internet censorship in Ecuador? Thank you. Well, I think this, the first one, Bethany can reply, maybe, because also there, there was a whole uh, renewal of, of the jurisdiction system. Second yeah. one is that the state of internet freedom is... Actually, we were going to publish another thing today. <laughs> Maybe I can, we can publish tomorrow. So, be, which is this, like they, can, they, they really, we have evidence that they have uh, blocked both Twitter and Google uh, during some days because uh, an anonymous group, had, anonymous, yeah, group, had published documents of the Senaim two years ago. So we have evidence that they actually blocked Twitter and YouTube. No, bro, sorry, YouTube and Google. Uh, so I think the, the state of internet freedom is, is very poor. Well, I, um, I think it's actually really interesting what's going on in Ecuador because you see the use of, of tactics 
of softer tactics like DMCA uh, takedown notices through YouTube and Twitter and Facebook to get accounts shut down, to get videos taken down. Uh, and there's a massive investment in propaganda. There, has been, there have been publications saying that the government hires armies of trolls and puts them in an office and they flood social media with, with messages to sort of move the conversation in, in the direction that, they're, that they want. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. I don't see a lot of those shutdowns or, or blockages, but, but definitely attempts to influence what, what, what is said and what is read. Did you, did you have another question now? Thank you. Uh, Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Um, so, mic number three, please. Hi. Um, so, first of all, uh, I agree completely that there is a bunch of really problematic stuff going on, and I really especially appreciate Pedro's list of, of actions and questions. I think Sanayin is extremely problematic. I have two small questions. The first one is uh, the use of your word, uh, the word in the title, authoritarian. Um, the, the reason why I'm asking about that is because focusing on Alianza País, not, not Rafael Correa, I mean, they still have an approval rating of between 60 and 80%, depending on how you look Do at they? it. Do they? When was the last time you read that? Half a year ago, so. Um, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a uh, popular, like, it's an election system that seems to work. I haven't heard any allegations of, of voter fraud of any kind, right? So I guess, mm -hmm. like, for dem democracy, even though there are these bad things going on, is that actually authoritarian? And the second question comes with your specific history, uh, because you worked with the Flock Society, right? Mm -hmm. Which was funded by the government in order to investigate issues of copyright and intellectual property and freedom of speech and many of these things in order to actually make for better regulation. Uh, so it seems to me, uh, I mean, from my perspective, this is a complicated issue, but we have a big government that is pulling in a lot of different directions. It's very clear that the Sanayin and some parts of the presidency are pulling in bad directions, but there also seems to be a lot of areas of the government that are trying really hard to uh, a lot. go in other directions. I think that there are less and less, uh, and I think that there were a lot of people pulling in good directions, and you sort of, you see them leaving as it becomes more clear how hard it is to have a progressive agenda. Your first question uh, about the word authoritarian. Yeah, I can, well, okay. I would like to talk about well, that. The, regarding democracy, the party actually lost the last election that happened in Ecuador. They lost the mayor elections and, and prefect elections in a lot of cities and that that was the last election, uh, and it was widely considered to be a rebuke of their leadership. And the next elections are in two years, and it's not really looking good for them. I, I wouldn't bet on them. But you're right, it is a democracy, and... Uh, so do you well, think it's going to be better I, if so Alianza Pais loses? Do you think uh, I mean, the right-wing opposition is going to be better for the country? It depends who the opposition, who is, I who think, comes next. Mm, it's, it's not a democracy. It's not just because people vote that it's a democracy. Like if people don't have information enough to choose for whom they're voting and who are their leaders and what their leaders are doing, it's not a democracy. So it's, that's why I, I, I put on the title authoritarian, because people, they don't have information enough to judge by themselves what their leaders are doing. So are there any democracies then? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we all know no, the, the answer. No? <laughs> okay, so another question from Mike, number three. Hi, um, so I really appreciated your talk, and as uh, Pedro, we've never talked, but I talked with Bethany a lot before the talk, and I was really actually glad to see that there was a separation between the idea of a uniform state and the intelligence service. And I think the only mistake in your talk um, is the idea that there's a uniform state. So when you say Ecuador has fooled the world, I think that there are elements of the Ecuadorian government who actually do care about WikiLeaks. For example, the Ecuadorian government has offered to protect me from the US government. And I feel very strongly that they would actually back that up. And I've been to Ecuador a number of times, and while I've been there, I've had very bad experiences with the Senayin. 
And the presidency and the vice presidency actually protected me from the Sinaiin until I left the country. <laughs> so my experience is this. Um, I'm sorry to follow in the leftist tradition of giving a five minute speech and then ask, asking a self-answering question, but I'm gonna do that and you're gonna love it. So <laughs> they protected me and they let me know that the Sinaiin is dangerous and that even if you're a guest of the presidency, if the Sinaiin doesn't like you, you're gonna end up in a ditch with a bullet in your head. So if you can imagine, these are the political class of Ecuador that are explaining to me that they don't have the ability to protect even their guests, who they in theory want to protect. So to call that one country, and to say that the Sena'in and the Ecuadorian political class are the same, is a, hmm, I feel like it's a simplification that betrays your lack of information about how these power structures actually exist. And I, and I feel like the Sinaiin are extremely dangerous and it follows a pattern we see all around the world which is that the intelligence services of the world are out of control, they have total capture of telecommunication systems and they actually capture the political class inside and out. I mean, the presidency is very worried about the Sinaiin tapping his phone calls, for example, and there's no way that you can protect against an intelligence service of your own service. And so I think all your criticisms here are actually pretty much centered around the Sinaiin and the fact that there are external forces that are trying to empower the Sinaiin and to overthrow the Ecuadorian state. And I mean, I've met the Department of Defense, the, the, the Minister of Defense. I've met a former, bunch of- The well, former Minister of Defense. The former, yeah, that's One correct. of those who has left the government recently. Absolutely, but listen, when I met her, one of the things that she was very clear about was that there are elements in the Ecuadorian government, especially the Sinaiin, who are fucking scary and they want to kill people like Correa and her. And I think you can't say that that's the same. There's an internal political struggle and there are really good people who put their life on the line, some of whom have actually been killed, some people who have died. And there's also elements of the CIA in that country. I met the head of counterintelligence, I had dinner with him. Uh, that was fucking awkward, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk about pressing for end-to-end -end encryption and not getting anywhere? That was a conversation like that. And I didn't give him any drugs. And I, I would have, just didn't have the opportunity. But, <clears throat> but the point is, to, to say this as one thing is the mistake. And so I wonder if you can acknowledge, this is my question, can you acknowledge that the Sena'in is the big, big problem and that they actually control the political class and the political class is afraid of them and not the other way around? Yeah, exactly. Like, I think Bethany also told that Sena'in was a problem. We also, like, I personally think that Sena'in uh, is part of a bigger problem, which is, like, as Bethany told, there are a bunch of other kind of, uh, of legal measures which are restricting freedom of speech. I agree with that Sena'in, in a certain way, is a different thing from, from government, and in some, some ways they don't respect, actually, Korea's intentions. For example, we have evidence that they spy even Alianza País, which is, the, which is the, the Korea's party. Even though I think that Korea has power enough but to change these policies and try to change Sena'in from, yes, from the beginning, let's say, restructure Sena'in. I mean, maybe he doesn't want or it's not political worthy for him to try to do it now, especially because elections are coming. But I think and that's, that, that, that's also actually the, the purpose of this talk. We said we are, we're not going to just criticize the government, but in the end, we will try to demand some small two things to Korea, which is to implement an oversight uh, mechanism for Sena'in and restructure Sena'in in order for it to have basic standards of, of transparency. And, and he has the power to do that. And what he's going to say after this talk is he's, Correa is going to go on television and say, Sena'in is accountable. There are prosecutors in their office that approve every intercept. Um, we, uh, Correa founded Sena'in. It was his baby in 2009. And he's going to say, we wrote this new plan for national security, we got rid of all the old cops and we formed our new agency. He defends them in public. Um, and he's very bad at accepting criticism and, and, and taking, making reforms. And it's one of his biggest, his biggest downfalls. So I don't know, I mean, you can, at some point you have to 
lay some blame on him for his handling of them. If you want to believe that the Sinaiin is so evil that the president of the country can't reform them or challenge them or make any changes, I will hold a different view. But I agree with you that they are the biggest problem. Okay, got one more question from mic number two. Um, I was just wondering in terms of the, the discussion about Sinaiin, I think that, or well, I was wondering actually how you view it in an overall context. I mean, is, I guess, who's the bulldog? Is it Sinaiin who sort of has been raised and bred by Korea who then says, well, we're even afraid of this thing? Or is it the opposite, sort of, Sinaiin really is in control, able to, to um, do what it wants with Korea scared of it and really I, unable to move? It's more complex. You, you cannot I don't know, simplify it in this way. But I think I mean, Sinaiin, for example, for me, it's, it's part of a global problem, you know, which is a problem of the intelligence complex, as, you, as, as Jacob said. But uh, and my, my feeling is that Sinaiin really got out of his control. And if he can't do anything now, or if he was, doesn't want to do anything, he, he's still a complice. But I think, yeah, it's it are the, the two things. Like, he exercised some control on it, but on the other hand, there are some things that Senai does without, his, uh, without asking him. And he cannot really stop it anymore. There's another question from the mic number three. Hi again. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm glad that you said that because it, I could have just sat down, but um, I'll take this opportunity to say one other thing, which is that um, the Senayin being the primary problem, the question that's open to me is how do we deconstruct the intelligence service? I mean, I'm, I'm of the eliminate the state crypto world. You know, you want to get rid of the state, the state's dangerous, you know? You know, when you do cryptographic signatures, for example, or when you build laptops or something. And in general, maybe we want to also take that tactic also for states, real states. And so maybe Ecuador would be better off if you had a revolution. I'm not sure, but maybe. But then the question is, what about a limited revolution? So what are the actual practical things that you can do to get rid of this Enaeen? Like, for example, the way that people think about states with a person in charge of them, for example, Obama, is he really responsible for every bad thing that happens in America? Every yeah. time a cop shoots a black person, which is every single day, right? I, I, I feel like we have to think about states differently than we think about people, right? And, and so in this case, the question is, what does the political class of Ecuador and what can we as an international community do to destroy the intelligence service of Ecuador? And I feel like that's the question we should be asking because that's a thing we can turn into a political action plan and a subversive counter-revolutionary action plan, frankly, yeah. to actually do that. But the question is, what do we do? How do we do that? And to all of our friends in Sanayin, <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> you got us. But what do we do to take that down? How do you get rid of an intelligence service? Because if we're going to hold him responsible, what is the actual thing we need to do? Like go burn the building down? Probably don't do that. That seems like a bad idea because, you know, they can just move. So, you know. They have a really you, nice building. They have a pool. I, yeah. I've, <laughs> probably where they'll find all of our bodies the next time we're in Quito. <laughs> but... But hey, you know, you gotta die someday. So, but, but what, do we actually, what do we actually do? How do we do this? Like for example, it, we know they do mass surveillance. Um, they asked me actually to build a mass surveillance system to wiretap the entire country of Ecuador. And I I'm told glad them, you said that. I, I know that and I couldn't add it to my talk, but there you go. They have documents confirming that. And, and so, <laughs> so check it out. So I told them to go fuck themselves and I reported them to the presidency and uh, explained to the presidency that they uh, had asked me to do this specifically to bypass the judicial review because they wanted to wiretap judges in the political class. And I said, wow, you want to wiretap the democratically elected leaders? And they said, no, no, it's a translation problem. And I said, I, you know, I speak enough Spanish. And the <laughs> president's translator actually translated it. So I don't think it's a problem. I think you're proposing a coup. And uh, yeah, like I have your names. And uh, so I just, <laughs> you're fucked. And so the thing is, what do we do to stop that? I think the answer is we deploy crypto and we have political responses to that. But what do we really ask from Korea? Because when I went to them, they said, you know, what do we do? And I think it's a big open question because you don't take on a military or an intelligence service lightly. And when you do, you lose. They kill you. And these guys, I mean, these guys actually told me the CIA followed me 
to Ecuador and they ejected a CIA agent, which was very awkward, by the way. Um, and so, you know, what a fucking complex situation. So what do we actually do about that? For me, I just don't go back to Ecuador. But for people in Ecuador, that's not really an option. So what action plan do we actually have now? I can't believe I told you all those things, but fuck it. <laughs> Light it on fire. So. I can't believe you told us all those things either. I have a headache now. Yeah, well, you know, enjoy, you know the coffee here is great, but the dexamphetamine is even better. I mean, first of, first of all, I think like Korea must be must feel responsible. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry for a last question, but we can't do an answer to that. So I don't think thanks. anybody can answer that. <laughs> can, can I reply? <laughs> thanks a lot for the talk. Thanks a lot reply? for all the questions, for the conversations, <laughs> and yeah, thanks. <laughs>